All right, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking uh, about an hour out of your nice night uh, to listen to us on Social Security, Medicare, and tax planning. Uh, this is a unique workshop. We're going to go through a couple things tonight uh, on a lot of different strategies and a lot of retirement planning concepts. I do have the Q&A button active, so if you do have any questions throughout the workshop, uh, just put it in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll try to answer your questions either throughout or we'll leave some time at the end to answer everything. Uh, before I introduce my partner, Olgi Abatello, to go through the actual presentation, I wanted to take a couple seconds to go through our website. Uh, we did refresh this a couple months ago, so if you haven't been to it recently, I wanted to take a couple seconds to go through some important things. But our new link on the top, if you just go to LIFPG, so again, Long Island Financial Planning Group or LIFPG.com, it would take you right there. This is what the home screen looks like. Uh, you get to see our three beautiful faces here in the middle. And as you scroll down, there's a spot for you to answer or put any questions you have in then our office in Westbury, Long Island. I want to, uh, for the clients on the phone now, and even for our guests, we do have our new events tab. So if you go to the events and then hit upcoming and past events, it's going to bring you to things like tonight, our webinar on Social Security, Medicare, and tax planning, but then also some of the events that we're doing uh, throughout the year. This is uh, constantly updated and live, so we're going to update this as we do have other things. Then you can see some of our other events that we've held in the past. We have a awesome tools tab with things like advanced time segmentation, Augie's gonna talk about tonight, uh, more info on our client portal advice works, some market updates and just other resources for you. So if you or Augie mentioned things throughout the workshop that you just have a couple of questions on, always click the button here under the tools and you can learn a little bit more about those resources. And then last but not least, we have the contact us tab here. So if you just hit the contact information, you're going to get the three of us with a, a QR code. If you scan that on your phone, it uh, actually puts our content information directly in your phone. But if you're just looking for our work cell or a work number uh, or a fax even, it's directly right here for Jeremy, Augie, and myself. And then you can download our contact card if you're on your phone. Uh, again, just to save it there. A lot of what we're going to talk about today might need a further up, uh, meeting to go through some of this stuff. So if you hover over the contact us, we have our links to our calendar directly on here. So meeting with Jeremy, Augie, or myself, if you just click that link, it will bring you to another tab uh, with Calendly, which is again, ties directly into our calendars. So you can find the time that works best for you, schedule it, and then it goes directly on our calendars and yours, which is a, a little bit easier. Again, if you have any questions, you can put it under the contact us and the contact information request more information, you can schedule a time directly with us, or feel free if it's a, you know an easy question, just to put it live in the chat or the Q&A as we're going throughout the workshop today. So again, I'm gonna hand it off to Olgi, get into the presentation. I'll come back at the end to wrap us up and then to go through any Q&A that we did have, but enjoy the presentation and thanks for coming out tonight. All right. Good evening, everybody. And again, thank you for uh, taking time out of your night to uh, talk to us and uh, hear us talk about some uh, Social Security, Medicare, and tax planning throughout your retirement. Uh, these are you know, three of the big pieces of your puzzle, right? Um, if any of you have been to any of our in-person, I always talk about um, you know, your retirement income puzzle. Uh, whether or not any of you knew it, uh, you got onto this webinar tonight with one. Um, and for a lot of us on here tonight, right, the, the pieces are very similar. Social Security, Medicare, taxes, IRAs, 401ks, pensions, if we're lucky enough to have them. And ultimately that end game, right? What that puzzle is actually looking to be is probably pretty similar, right? I'm sure a lot of you want to have some relaxation, um, you know, some extra time with friends and family, maybe some beaches, vacations, and then also most importantly, maybe a cocktail or two with an umbrella in it. Uh, but the size and how those pieces come together is going to be different for each and every one of us, you know, here tonight. Um, you know, Social Security benefits are not going to be exactly the same, how much we've contributed to our 401ks or 403bs, 
deferred comps is going to be different and whether we're privy to a pension or not, right? Some of us are going to have different pension amounts or maybe not pensions at all. So when we look at those, uh, you know, the end game of those puzzles, right? Some of those beaches, you know, might be here, right here on Long Island at Robert Moses. For others of us, that beach we're visiting might be down in Florida. And for some of us, those beaches might be in Italy off the Amalfi Coast, right? But the importance of tonight is that uh, recently I was told, you know, that uh, tonight is going to be like drinking from a fire hose, right? Uh, is that we're going to give you a lot of information. And the goal is that you take that information, digest it. And I'm going to show you towards the end of this presentation of how, if you don't have one already, using a retirement income strategy, you can make educated decisions. Um, research data has shown us that a lot of people take their Social Security or take money from their IRAs or 401ks just because it's available, not because they actually did any research or put any thought into how to actually do that or how that actually impacts the other pieces of their retirement. So tonight, we're going to get into how the Social Security, Medicare, and tax planning kind of all shape what your retirement could look like. All right, so we're going to start off just with some social, you know, basic Social Security. Um, so Social Security, right, at age 62, each of those years' earnings are tallied up and indexed for inflation. So if you obviously were working, right, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, um, all those different numbers are brought up to today's dollars. So you don't have to worry about, you know, the power of time when it comes to your earnings. Your highest 35 years of earnings are then averaged to what's called your AIM, your average index monthly um, uh, uh, monthly um, payout. Those, it's highest 35, it's not consecutive, right? So if you lost you know, some time due to uh, raising children, uh, injuries, ailments, things of that nature, don't worry, it's not consecutive. It is your highest 35. The downside to that is if we don't have 35 years, we're going to be averaging zeros into that 35 years. All right. Your aim is then divided by three different bend points to determine what's called your primary insurance amount. That is the amount that you would receive at your full retirement age. So if you have seen your Social Security statement recently, that is the number that you would get at your full retirement age. And that benefit is increased each year by the cost of living adjustments. So whether it's your own benefit, a survivor benefit, a spousal benefit, whenever it comes to Social Security, if you take your benefits early, just remember, you're going to get a percentage, okay? So just for the sake of tonight, I'm going to be looking at the column that your full retirement age is 66. So if you take your benefit at 62, you're going to get 75% of your benefit at 63, 80, and so on until you get to 66 at 100%. Now, the beauty of this is the fact that it is not as rigid as what the, the chart is showing. And what I mean by that is, is the benefit is accrued daily. So if you go and click the button on the website when you are 62, six months in the you know 12th hour of the day, you would be exactly at you know uh, half of between 75 and 80 percent. All right. Uh, so it actually you know accrues to the exact moment you push that button. So the big question is then what happens if we actually wait until after our full retirement age to take our Social Security? Each year that you wait, you're going to actually earn 8% delayed credits. So these delayed credits, again, assuming that you have a full retirement age of 66, if you took it at 67, you're going to get 108, right? And you wait another year, 116, all the way up to age 70, where now that is 132%. There is not another slide on this. Uh, this is the end of the chart, right? So at 70, you would want to take your Social Security. That is going to be the maximum. What this chart and what your Social Security statements don't tell you is that the 8% delayed credits are also compounded by inflation. So you do get, uh, or cost of living adjustments. So a couple of years ago, right, when we experienced, you know, the really high inflation, interest rates went through the roof, we had, you know, a couple of years there where uh, the Social Security cost of living was 8%. So if you turned 66 a few years ago and you waited, you got your 8% delayed credit plus an 8% cost of living adjustment. So this year, if you turn 66 and that's your full retirement age, if you wait, you're going to get the 8% and the 3% cost of living adjustment. So that's a guaranteed 11% that you would get on your Social Security payout by waiting an additional year, right? So we do have some guaranteed, you know, financial tools out there. Most of them, uh, to my knowledge, are nowhere near 11%, right? So the good news is, is that if we have a retirement income plan in place, we are able to then 
maybe take some assets from other places that we had stashed aside already, knowing that we're going to get that guaranteed 11% by waiting on Social Security. So just a different way of looking at your Social Security benefit rather than just saying, I can get it at 62 or 66. If you haven't seen your Social Security statement at all or you know recently, uh, you can go to socialsecurity.gov slash my account or ssa.gov for short. Uh, it's going to come up again a little bit later. Uh, but going back to the puzzle scenario, right? We always want to know our pieces. So we want to make sure that our you know, record is accurate, make sure that we're not missing any pieces. So um, you know, we have found, you know, because again, Social Security is uh, when they are putting those numbers in for you, those are based off tax numbers, right? So based on your uh, income taxes. So that, that those dollars that come up on your income tax are then inputted into the system. We have seen those dollar amounts be incorrect. Sometimes people are missing some digits, right? So instead of making 300,000, it's only 30,000. And that could impact obviously your payout going down the road. And if you're not going to claim your benefit tomorrow morning, it gives you time to then change or you know amend whatever is wrong, right? If unfortunately you're going to claim soon and then you find this error, it could take Social Security months, even years to fix that you know correction. And you will get it you know all the retro pay, but until they do, your benefit could be substantially lower. The other thing is, you know, some of these next options you may not want to hear, but if you don't have 35 years of history, of uh, work history, you may want to work a couple extra years to maybe get rid of a couple of those zeros. So that will impact your, um, your benefit, you know, a little bit more positive. Or if you are at a point in your career right now where you are making substantially more money than you did earlier in your career, you might want to work a few extra years. So now you drop off those lower earning years with the higher earning years, and then that will also impact your benefit as well. So these are just some of the scenarios that if you have anything else, um, I didn't mention this when I first started, but both myself and Jeremy, our other business partner who was uh, not able to be on tonight, we are both certified social security claiming strategists. Big fancy word to say that we get some cool calculators. So uh, you know, we've gotten scenarios where you know uh, we have had clients say, oh, you know, I make 150, 300,000, but I'm looking to work part-time, you know, maybe make 30 to 50,000 over the next three to five years. Is that going to impact my Social Security? And so we have the ability to give you that type of information, you know, and see what makes the most sense um, if it's not or if it is going to impact, you know, uh, either positively or negatively. So any scenario that you might have, we could use that in what uh, any of our calculators to give you a good, you know, uh, rough estimate of what your benefits might look like in the future. So uh, this is usually a time in the presentation, you know, especially if I'm in person, I usually joke around with everybody and say, you know, reach into your pockets or your uh, pocketbooks and uh, pull out your crystal ball, uh, give it a couple good shakes and let me know when you're going to pass away because then we can tell you exactly when to take your social security, right? And unfortunately, we don't have that power, right, uh, where we you know, know exactly when our time here on earth is gone. But we could use the time, the, the context clues around us to try to make an educated decision of what makes the most sense for us, right? And this is going to differ for every single person, you know, here tonight. So the first thing to look at is health expectancy and life expectancy, uh, health status and life expectancy, right? So if, uh, you know, parents, grandparents, you know, and great grandparents maybe all lived, you know, very long lives, uh, we are, you know, maybe exercising, taking care of ourselves, uh, taking preemptive medication. We like to say in the business, you know, act like you're going to be around a while because, you know, the, the stack is, you know, in, you know, in your deck is in your hands, right, for the most part. Um, vice versa, you know, if longevity is not in the family and we're not in the greatest uh, health, then maybe, you know, it, it does make sense to take Social Security a little bit earlier. Need for income. We never tell anybody that if you need money, right, to just go out and uh, collect scrap metal or bottle caps to make ends meet so you could delay your Social Security, right? If you need money, take the Social Security, and then we'll figure out your plan from there. Whether or not you plan to work, I'm going to cover this in, in a couple minutes, but if you are under your full retirement age and you are deciding to take your Social Security, and continue to work, there is going to be some impact that you want to you know, keep an eye on. And then lastly is survivor needs. So survivor needs is where a lot of times, you know, especially if uh, there's a spouse involved, uh, if there's a we, a lot of times, you know, Social Security is taken as a me. It's my Social Security. It's my benefit. I'm taking it whenever I want, whereas it should be looked at as a we. And so we want to make sure that that is a factor that is, you know, involved in deciding, you know, when one spouse takes it versus the other. 
So like I just mentioned, this is what the earnings test looks like at the end of 2023. So this applies if you are working before your full retirement age and you decide that you want to you know, claim Social Security. So in 2024, the amount is you know, just a little over this one. It you know, does get indexed for you know, for inflation each and every year. Uh, but for as of last year, for every $2 over $21,240, you'll have $1 in benefit withheld. All right. And what that means is that it, that $1 is not stolen from you. It's withheld, which means that it is factored back into your benefit at full retirement age, and then paid out you know, over your life expectancy. So you're not going to get a big you know, chunk of uh, you know, increase at, at your full retirement age, but it will increase that at that point. If you compared yourself of not taking the benefit and versus you know, having the money withheld at the point of full retirement age, your benefit would be substantially lower if you had your know, benefits withheld. Uh, this is one of the things that, again, we could help you uh, decide if it makes sense or not to take your Social Security so we could run the annual earnings test and let you know of how that actually works. So just for instance, let's say you have a $2,500 Social Security benefit. And you make, you know, make numbers nice and easy here. You make exactly $10,000 over that 21240 So technically $5,000 will be withheld, right? And so, um, sorry, let me change it to $2,400 benefit. So that $2,400 benefit is going to be completely taken, right, withheld from you. So your first check, $2,400, and the second check, $2,400, are going to be taken. And because there's a little bit over that $200, that third check is going to be taken also. So they don't do partial checks, right? So that's why, depending, you know, again, if you're making over $100,000, probably doesn't make sense for you to take your Social Security prior to full retirement age. But once you actually get to full retirement age, you can make as much money as humanly possible, and they are not going to withhold anything. So if you're just worried about the earnings test, or you're not going to really receive much of your benefit, I would just hold off, wait until your full retirement age, and then you can make as much money as you want and take, take your Social Security, and they're not going to you know withhold anything. Um, so this is one of those things that usually requires some follow up. You know, when we do speak with people of, you know, let us know your numbers, and we'll let you know how many checks they're going to withhold and if it makes sense or not. You know, again. From the previous slide, if you need money, you know, even if they withhold two or three checks, that still gives you a pretty good amount of money for the rest of the year. So we want to coordinate spousal benefits, right? And uh, there's a couple mainstream, you know, strategies that they call where uh, one is the maximization strategy, where the higher earning spouse waits until 70, the lower earning spouse takes their benefit right away, whether it's 62 or any point in between. Um, so you get a little bit of money now, and then you're maximizing at least one of the benefits. There is, um, you know, where you both take it 62, uh, so then you're both taking, you know, lower, you know, at the as soon as you can. And then there's these hybrid strategies, right? And hybrid could be anything in between, right? So, you know, anything between 62 and 70. Um, so if there's a scenario that you have that you want to run by us, say, can we do this? Can we do that? Yeah, we would, you know, again, we have some really great calculators that would be able to give you over your lifetime what kind of benefits you could receive, what makes the most sense, you know, for the both of you in congruence to your retirement income plan. Survivor benefits, um, they are super tricky just because uh, out of everything else, they depend on two things, right? The, the two things they depend on is one, when the original person actually claimed, and then when the survivor actually claims. So here is an example of Joe and Julie, a married couple. Joe's primary insurance amount is $2,800. Joe actually delayed claiming to age 70. So his benefit is now 124% of that $2,800 or just shy of $3,500. So Joe passes away. Julie's survivor benefit, if she waits to her full retirement age, will be the $3,472, not the $2,800. So even though the floor drops for survivors uh, to 60, so normal benefit, right, you could take it at 62, survivors could actually take it at 60, and if you're disabled, actually 50. So even though the floor is dropped, remember, it's going to be a percentage, right? So if Joe claims earlier, right, than his full retirement age, he's now going to get a percentage. Then if Julie doesn't wait to her full retirement age, she's going to get a percentage of the percentage, all right? So just keep that in mind. As I mentioned earlier, if you take things early, you're always going to get a percentage. 
So with survivor benefits, you can take advantage of the delayed correct uh, the delayed claiming. Spousal benefits, you do not, right? So meaning that if Joe's benefit in this example is twenty eight hundred dollars, if Julie's is anything less than fourteen hundred dollars, she would be able to put the spousal tack on and get fourteen hundred dollars a month. All right, but if Joe delays, she's not going to get that tack on on the delayed credits. It's just then based off that twenty eight hundred. So taxation of benefits, it is something that is very rarely talked about. And uh, the way it's calculated is something you've probably never seen before, and it's called provisional income. So provisional income is the your adjusted gross income plus one half of the Social Security benefit plus any tax exempt interest. So unfortunately, it's the one time that probably in your adult life where the uh, municipal bonds or municipal bond fund tax exempt interest would actually you know counts against you. But basically, the way this works is if you add up those three things, and if your provisional income for a married joint couple is under 32000 the first 32000 0% of your Social Security is taxed. The next thirty-two to 44000 up to 50% is taxed, and over 44000 up to 85% is taxed. And again, it's just the percentage of your Social Security benefit that is taxed. It's not the actual bracket, right? So that is going to be determined by your ordinary income, all right? So this is, I'm going to show you an example uh, real quick of uh, this guy, Bill, here, of how, you know, to really try to understand your provisional income. And I'm going to give you a real-life example after this. Uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, a client of ours of how we're uh, adjusting her income plan because her provisional income is actually going to go up in the future. So Bill, he's retired. He has a taxable income of 46000 which puts him in about the 22% bracket. But his overall income is actually 75000 know, a little over 75000 So because his income includes $38,000 from his IRA and $37,500 from Social Security, because the way the provisional income works, he only has about $46,138 of taxable income. So in this scenario, Bill is going to touch his IRA. He wants to take a concert uh, road trip, which again, personally, I think $1,000 is a, a little cheap for that. But for example, tonight, he wants to take, you know, innocently that $1,000. And for most of us, you know, and even if I probably go to most advisors out there and said, oh, how much tax would, you know, he owe on that hundred, on that $1,000, most people would just be like, oh, about the 22%. But the way this works is even though Bill is only increasing his IRA income by 1000 for the year, he's actually increasing his adjusted gross income and his taxable income by 1850 And it's just because of the formula of how you build the provisional income, that incrementally goes up more than just the 1000 that he takes from the IRA. So now he's going to owe not just 22%, but almost the equivalent of 40%. So he's going to owe about $407 of income tax on that $1,000 from the IRA. So when we are helping our clients build retirement income plans, we have this built into it, knowing that you know we calculate the provisional income and look at it. So if you are able to have maybe other income sources that are maybe not qualified, so maybe Roth IRAs, maybe some cash value life insurance, or even just, you know, some non-qualified assets that, you know, maybe might pay some capital gains tax, or, you know, if it's at a loss, you know, you, you don't have to uh, have any kind of reported income on it. So we don't innocently take a thousand, 10,000, whatever that number is for you to then have a, a downfall. And in what the slide says, you know, that's that tax torpedo where now your social security, maybe your pension, all those things are getting more tax because we kind of weren't really paying attention. So we are again, able to go through that provisional income with you. And as I was just mentioning, I was sitting down with someone in the last few weeks and um, they don't need any money right now, but in the next few years, they are going to need to increase their uh, income by $20,000. So I reviewed how their pension and Social Security is taxed today. And right now, her Social Security overall is taxed about 70% uh, 70 of her Social Security benefit is taxed. 
Once we start kicking off that $20,000 from her retirement accounts, the Social Security is going to be taxed you know, fully at the 85%. So knowing that that's happening, right, we're planning that a few years in advance, knowing that she's going to be paying a few extra thousand dollars in tax. So it's not like she's going to get the whipsaw effect of like, oh, man, I have all this extra tax to pay. Where am I coming up from? We are planning it three years in advance. So that's the beauty of having a retirement income plan and a team like myself, Dominic, and Jeremy, where we're we actually are taking into account these things now and in the future when you're actually going to start touching your money. So all this stuff that I mentioned with Social Security, um, with all the different options, all the different planning ideas, we are uh, use a third party to put this together. So what we generally say is if it is able to go into this calculator, it is not wrong. Um, you know, generally, Jeremy's, um, you know, will we'll tell this story. So hopefully I don't butcher it too much. But a family friend of his, um, you know, she sat down with Jeremy, they were doing all the retirement planning. Um, and, um, you know, they did the Social Security analysis, everything. And right around retirement, um, his it was a family friend of his, the, the husband passed away. So the wife called Jeremy and said, you know, uh, your husband passed away. Um, you know, what do I do? And so Jeremy went through everything all over again, you know, redid the analysis and, and everything. And so when she was getting ready for Social Security, she had it in mind that, you know, his benefit is higher. I'm going to take his. So Jeremy did the Social Security analysis, and it actually made sense for her to take her benefit first because she was under her full retirement age. And then wait until full retirement age to then take her late husband's. And that would then maximize that benefit, as I mentioned earlier. So there's no percentages. She would have gotten his benefit 100%. So uh, Jeremy then layered that into her retirement income you know, uh, plan. And over the course of you know, average life expectancy with a modest rate of return, that was going to give her an extra couple hundred thousand dollars that she would then be passing on to her, her two children. So just in that scenario, just by switching up of when to take, you know, her survivor benefit gave her more money, you know, over the course of her retirement and is now going to give a higher, you know, legacy to her family. So she took the analysis and went to Social Security and said, you know, I, I met with my financial advisor. I, I want to do this. They turned around to her and said, no, you can't. And she said, well, Jeremy told me if it was on this piece of paper, it can't be wrong. So I'd like to speak to somebody else. So they brought out the supervisor and the supervisor took a look and said, you can absolutely do this. So if she did not sit down with Jeremy, and didn't have the confidence to say, no, you're wrong. It's on this piece of paper. She never would have, uh, you know, been able to do the strategy that, you know, he suggested. And, um, this was a while ago, and it just came due that she now switched over to her full retirement age, and she got almost a $20,000 raise by just switching over the benefits. So now she has a nice inflation adjustment in her retirement income plan that now she doesn't have to touch any of her other retirement assets for a while. So there is anything and anything that you have on your own or anything that we suggest, we could you know, use this as a tool to then layer into the retirement income plan. So I'm going to switch gears over to Medicare now. Um, I know uh, I probably have you at the edge of your seats, you know, talking about Social Security. So we're going to get, you know, really rocking with the Medicare right now. But, um, you know, just to give you a, a perception, right, of, you know, the Medicare is obviously most people have the Medicare come from their Social Security check. If you have a primary insurance amount of $2,600, your full uh, and your full retirement age is 67. If you take your benefit at 62, again, right, you're going to get a percentage you're going to get $1,820 a month. Your Part B premium, uh, which is $165, and it, it's up to $175 this year, would represent almost 10% of your check. So before your Social Security even hits your bank account, 10% is already gone and went to Medicare. Versus if you waited till 70, now your benefit's at 124% of that you know, $2,600, and it's at $3,224, and it only represents 5% of your check. All right. So just kind of a little tidbit of kind of just looking at it from a different you know, lens. So when it comes to Medicare, there's four parts, right? There's part A, which is your hospital insurance, part B, which is your medical insurance. These are both provided by Medicare. Then we have part C, which is your Medicare Advantage plan. And then your part D, Medicare prescription coverage plan. These are both covered, uh, provided by private insurers um, that contract with Medicare. So this is where uh, 
Jeremy, Dominic, and myself, even though we are licensed, we do use uh, you know, third parties to, um, you know, and Medicare specialists to handle these types of things. So for any of you that are in Suffolk County, we have you know, a specialist in Suffolk. We also have one in uh, Nassau, Queens uh, area. So no matter where you live, uh, we have someone that, you know, is... Um, can meet you in person or just, you know, even just over the phone, whatever it is, you know, for convenience, uh, you know, for any of your shopping needs. So the there's generally two options, right? The option one is what's called the original Medicare. This includes Part A and B. So you have your Part A hospital insurance plus your Part B medical insurance. And then you could add your Part D Medicare prescription plan. And then you could also add your Medigap uh, supplements to make sure that you know, your out-of-pocket costs are as little as possible when it comes to this. The other option is option two, which is your Medicare Advantage plan. This is that Part C. So that includes Part A, B, and D all together. All right. And again, you would shop for this individually through then your, your Medicare specialist or on your own, whatever you decide. Um, but I would say, you know, to look at both and uh, I'm going to use my mom as an example. Uh, so uh, she turned 65 a couple of years ago. Um, I was with her when we, we were speaking to the Medicare specialist and we went through both options. And for her, she uh, uh, went with the original Medicare option one because uh, my mom has had asthma for most of her life. Um, she is very familiar with her doctors. She doesn't obviously feel like switching at this point in time in her life. So with the Medicare Advantage Part C, she her doctors were considered at a network, and that was a deal breaker for her. So that's why she decided to stay with the original Medicare. Um, so that's why even if you are trying to shop on your own or deciding what might be the best for you, the Medicare specialist sometimes could be an extra you know, lever of expertise for you uh, because uh, they have no skin in the game. They are compensated by Medicare, so they do not care you know, what companies you use. You know, usually the people that we refer to uh, specifically, you know, they get your information, your your doctors, your medications. You'll get to know you, and then you can have a good conversation on what makes the most sense, you know, for you and your specific situation. And sometimes if you are married, sometimes you know, even marry couples like my mom and dad, right? Can completely separate your know, scenarios. So, you know, even spouses could have, you know, uh, two different options. So, you know, even though your spouse might have option one, that may not be the best thing for you based on, you know, your health and, and what you're looking to do. So how do we actually enroll in Medicare? If you're actually receiving Social Security when you turn 65, Medicare parts A and B are automatic. You can decline if you don't want Part B, meaning uh, if you have coverage through work or um, you know a really good health plan when you retire. Coverage starts the first of the month you turn 65. And then Part C and D are not automatic. Again, you must choose those private insurers and proactively enroll on your own. If you're not receiving Social Security when you turn 65, you must sign up through the Social Security Administration during one of the enrollment periods. So we have the initial enrollment period um, if you're not covered by a group plan at 65. This is typically three months before your birthday and three months after your birthday. So it's that seven-month window that you have to, uh, to sign up. We then have the special enrollment period where if you are covered by a group plan at 65, and then the, uh, the general enrollment period is if you missed both of those previous two, you can enroll during the general enrollment period, which is generally uh, January 1st to March 31st each year. I would say at this point in time, um, if you're not sure, especially if you are still working and you're getting close to 65, that you would want to talk to the Medicare specialist and your HR department, especially if you are getting to the point where you're looking to retire right at 65, you do not want to get into a, a situation where your employer plan or the COBRA or anything like that ends and you are not enrolled in Medicare, and now you have to wait for the general enrollment period for the following year, right? So God forbid, let's say, you know, if um, we don't plan properly, it's July, you have no medical coverage, and you have to wait until January for the general, general enrollment period, right? So you don't want to you know, be crossing your fingers not to get sick or ill or hurt or anything like that. So you want to just make sure that you are coordinating with your HR department and your Medicare specialist. Um, they will both help in that to make sure your specific benefits and needs are covered and making sure that you know, you're not going to have any gaps in coverage with that. So how do we actually sign up for parts A and B if that's what you're looking to do? Again, the website that I mentioned earlier to check your Social Security statement is the same that you're going to go apply for your Medicare benefits. So SSA.gov. So we could check our Social Security benefits. We could apply for Social Security, and we could also apply for Medicare with all that same uh, website. 
So there are some out-of-pocket costs, you know, when it comes to, you know, Medicare. So number one uh, is your premiums, right? So the Part B premiums are paid directly to Medicare, like I showed you in a couple of those slides. Uh, it's $175. The private insurance premiums, so you have your Part D uh, drug plan plus your Medigap policies or the Medicare Advantage plan, whatever you decide, you know, from that perspective. And then your out-of-pocket, uh, other out-of-pocket costs could include some deductibles, the portion of the doctor bills that are not paid by Medicare, and then services that are not covered by Medicare. And I'll go through a little of those in a little bit. So monthly premiums, just to dive in a little deeper, part A, are zero dollars to you um, if you paid more or your spouse paid more than 40 quarters into the Social Security system. Part B, as I mentioned, last year was $165. This year, it's $175, um, plus income-related monthly adjustments, if applicable, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And then also uh, the Part Ds, which is then paid to the private insurer. This does vary with plans. Um, so again, shopping either yourself or through the Medicare specialist, you could you know, kind of compare and see you know, what's best for you. And again, uh, there could be some income related monthly adjustments um, you know, on this as well. So since I mentioned it twice, uh, just very shortly, the it's called IRMA for short, if you ever heard of that acronym, but it's it's called income related monthly adjustments. And uh, like anything else in this beautiful country of ours, uh, the more money you make, uh, the more money goes somewhere else, right? So the more money we make, the more taxes we pay. And in, in this case, the more money that goes to Medicare. So for a married couple with a joint income of 194,000 to 246,000, you're gonna pay, and again, I'm using last year's numbers, uh, you're gonna pay that $165 a month. And then you're also gonna pay an extra $66 a month on top of that, all right? And then for part D, this is an average, right? So it could be more or less depending on your plan and what you're looking at, but the average is about $40. And then the extra is $12.20. So you can see here that if you uh, are slightly in, again, right, going from that bill scenario earlier, right, if you're normally under 194000 as a married couple, but we decide to go on a really nice expensive trip or something along those lines, and we take out $10,000, $20,000, and that pushes us over that $194,000, you're going to be paying an extra $80 a month now you know, uh, for those following years because of that extra income. So to kind of show you that, in a real life uh, or as in a hypothetical example, we got George and Martha here, right? So they both have the Medicare parts B and D. They have $306,000 in modified adjusted gross income in 2021. So they innocently sell a stock for a thousand dollar gain, right? So we're switching it up a little bit. So they have, uh, you know, say they, they bought a stock for 10,000, it grew to 11. So they're gonna pay tax on that thousand dollar gain. So they're gonna owe about 188, whoops, sorry. They are going to pay about $188 in capital gains tax, right? So pretty good. But what happens is because now it throws them over the $306,000 mark, they're each going to be paying $263 extra every single month. All right. So, and that's each, right? That's for both of them. So when it comes to, again, right, taking income, right, innocently, Hey, I just took a thousand dollars. You know, I took an eleven thousand dollars, right? It was a thousand dollar gain. I didn't know anything about it, and that's where Dominic, myself, and Jeremy come in, right? Is where, if, let's say, we are selling, you know, in this case, a stock or a mutual fund, something along those lines, for a gain. We could do what's called tax harvesting, where we could go into your portfolio and maybe sell something that also has a loss. So now we're offsetting that gain, and now hence we're not throwing yourself over that that income you know bracket for in this case Irma, right? And if we throw Bill and George and Martha into the same bucket, right, where we're going on a concert and we're selling a stock in the same year, and we're just con you know just kind of willy nilly just doing it on our own. It could cost us thousands upon thousands of dollars in tax and IRMA charges, whereas if we have a solid plan, we could adjust for it and know it, right? Someone who doesn't, they can see a lot of their retirement income money go out the window a lot faster because they're paying these extra IRMA charges or they're paying extra taxes that they weren't planning on. So to kind of show you then for the Part D, you know, it's the plan premium plus then an additional $51 per person. So overall, George and Martha 
are paying about $2,800 extra in the IRMA surcharges. And then you tack on the $188, um, you know, capital gains tax that they they pay. So now we're talking, you know, over $3,000 extra, where if you're on, I'm not going to say a tight retirement budget, right? But if we're just throwing an extra 3000 or 6000 here for taxes and then an extra 3 or 6000 for Irma right that could dwindle down your retirement buckets pretty quick if we're just not taking or you know doing anything and just kind of flying by the seat of our pants so something to consider uh, whether you're retired or uh, or leading up to retirement is uh, some Roth IRA conversions. And what this is, is taking your 401k, 403b, traditional IRAs, deferred comps, you know, whatever is your pre-tax money that you haven't paid tax on yet. You can do what's called a conversion where you pay the tax and then it goes and sits in a Roth IRA. And so now that Roth IRA can then grow tax-free for you. All right, so just a quick example, you know, we have Jill, she has $100,000, um, she takes $100,000 from her IRA and converts it to her Roth. So what Jill is doing is now adding $100,000 to her income for that year. So obviously this could be expensive, right? And um, depending, again, we have calculators and projections to show you does Roth, you know, conversions make sense for you, right? Some of us have done such a great job of saving that, it just doesn't make sense to pay all that tax now because by the time you know you really need to get the return, you know we might be you know way long gone. Or the other option is is the fact that you just have so much pre-tax that it's really not going to make a difference in your required minimum distribution. So you know we're just going to plan on it. But if done soon enough, you can maybe make your required minimums a lot less that you have to take down the road. And on a personal note, I would say in the nearer future, we are in a historically low tax bracket now. Don't know how much longer it's going to last, but as time goes on, right, tax brackets might be going up. So if I wanted to pay tax on thirty or fifty or maybe even a hundred thousand dollars, I might want to pay it in a lower bracket today than when I'm going to have to pay down the road. So uh, a couple of times of what we have seen is I mentioned earlier when it came to um, the inaccuracy of, you know, uh, the claim in the Social Security of where we have clients making, you know, 300000 and they turn to us and say, hey, I'm going to only, you know, work part time and make 50. Well, in that case, sometimes we tell clients like, hey, you're used to paying tax on that 300000 Let's convert, you know, some of that pre-tax money to your free retirement income. So you're used to that tax and we could just do that over a couple of years. So you're, you're kind of, you'll fill in that bucket. And that is one of the strategies that is uh, commonly used for Roth IRA conversions is called filling up the bracket. So we're not causing any ill will or any other, you know, pain of paying the IRS. But if you are, you know, kind of spilling over into the 22% bracket today, we're just going to fill that 22% bracket, right? We don't want to start paying 24, 32 or higher percentage on it. So we'll just, you know, make sure that we don't go over that 22. And so for, you know, some of you on, you know, uh, you know, to, uh, for tonight, that might make a huge difference, right? Taking over maybe five to 10 years, a, uh, you know, significant amount of money might be able to then just stash a lot of money away into those tax-free areas that we don't then have to take for a while afterwards. So just to get back to some other money that you have to pay out of pocket for Medicare, um, you have your deductibles. So for Part A, it is $1,600 per spell of illness. Uh, part B is $266 per year, and then Part D is $505 per year. All right, um, here's some more numbers for you, I would say. And again, the reason why we use our two Medicare specialists is because they go very slow and go over this stuff with you in person. So if you are not getting this right now from me, because I'm you know, literally probably doing the same thing that you guys are doing and reading off the screen of the these numbers, I don't have these memorized. Um, but if you're unsure after tonight, you know, the Medicare specialist will go over this with you again. Um, and that's where, you know, helping making sure that your gaps and, and coverage and all this stuff is, is taken care of. Um, but you do have some co-insurance. So the Part A is $480 uh, for days 61 through 90, and then $800, you know, for days 91 to 50. And then the skilled nursing is $200 a day for days 21 to 100. For Part, uh, part B, you know, for assigned claims, it is 20% of the Medicare approved rate. For unassigned claims, it is 20% of the approval rate and the balance of the actual charge up to an additional 15% of the approved charge. 
So what does Medicare cover? Unfortunately, the list is not that long, as you can see. Um, but you know, for a hospital, it is 100% of the first 60 days. For uh, medical services, it does cover doctor visits and uh, most outpatient services, and then 80% of the Medicare approved amount. And then some preventive ser uh, services of like flu shots and certain screenings and things of that nature. Um, I know it's in tiny print, um, but if you want to jot down, uh, if you go to Medicare.gov or just Google Medicare in you, um, that does give you a little bit more in depth in you know, what it does cover. Here's the list of what it doesn't cover, right? It's a little bit more expansive. Um, so it doesn't cover long-term care, care delivered outside the U.S., dental, vision, hearing aids, cosmetic surgery, acupuncture, you know, other alternative cares, um, the amounts over the Medicare approved amount, and then amounts not covered by the deductibles or coinsurance. So the good news is for some of these things of what Medicare doesn't cover, that's where your Medigap, you know, coverage can come in. If you do go the option one route where you're, you're buying your know, part C is D and then the Medigap, I'm sorry, uh, part D and, and Medigap. So that could help you know, eliminate some of these extra costs for you. Again, reiterating, I've mentioned this already a couple of times. You just want to you know, shop carefully. Um, if if you're you know a little nervous about doing it yourself, again, right? Uh, just ask Dominic, Jeremy, myself. We could get you in touch with the the Medicare person uh, to help you out. Um, the Medigap policies are A through N. They are standardized, you know, across the country and uh, through for the most part, you know, all the different plans. Just there's a little you know difference in price points. Um, and I would say that just like your investment portfolio, right, where you're constantly updating and checking it, hopefully at least once a year, right, uh, I would do the same thing with your Medicare. So, you know, each and every year, I would reach out to the Medicare specialist and just, you know, say, hey, what's going on? Anything new? Um, and just to give you an idea, you know, my dad, uh, even though he is just turning 65 this year, he's been on Medicare for a while. He, you know, he's been uh, disabled, so he's been on Medicare for a while. And he was in this one plan for, for probably decades. And when my mom was getting her Medicare done, we said, hey, you should probably, you know, sit down and go through your stuff too. And it turned out that he actually wound up saving himself $250 a month. Um, so, you know, some plans, right, uh, as our health changes, sometimes for the positive, sometimes for the negative, uh, you know, for the positive, maybe we come off some medications that we were on, right? Maybe uh, if it was a cholesterol or high blood pressure medicine, something along those lines, we're in better shape. We don't need those medications anymore maybe you could adjust your plan then you know uh, accordingly or vice versa you know maybe we have the cholesterol or the high blood pressure medicine now and the plan that we were on doesn't necessarily you know do the job anymore so you could take a look you know each and every year during that um you know october is usually when the rates come out so you can then reach out see, you know, if that plan is still worth or, you know, um, you know, staying in, or it doesn't make sense to move into something else. And you can go through that, you know, with the specialist as well. All right. Uh, so when it does come to then the overall planning of healthcare costs, right? Uh, Fidelity, the Employee Benefit Research Institute, they tell us it's about 300,000 for couples, you know, through retirement um, for, you know, all the different things that we talked about tonight. You might have some personal history or you know personal experience that you might have your own number, right? It might be a little bit less, might be tremendously more than you know what uh, that three hundred thousand that fidelity says, right? And so when we sit down, and uh, if you don't have you know that retirement income strategy yet, you know that is part of the conversation, right? How much do you want to have you know prepared for those types of costs? And we can put that into the strategy to make sure that we are giving ourselves that buffer, you know, besides having those annual trips and besides making that our you know just normal standard of living and groceries and all those things that are in there. We could always add, you know, extra, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 a year for those healthcare costs if that is important to you to make sure that we cover all the contingencies that could happen in a plan. Um, the next, besides just the actual healthcare cost, is then the over looming long term care, right? Um, that is not covered by Medicare or Medigap. Skilled nursing care, there is no coverage after 100 days. And uh, there is no coverage at all for help with uh, the activities of daily living. So what do we actually do, right? There's where you could, you know, what they commonly call become poor enough for Medicaid, which, you know, for some of us on tonight, it's just not, it's just impossible, right? We have way too many assets and income and things of that nature to ever get to that point. 
Also, I always tell people, right, Medicaid services means Medicaid, you know, if you qualify for Medicaid, that means you get, you know, Medicaid services, which may not be up to your standard of, you know, what you are currently living in now. So if we could either self fund or help with insurances, that's where you know we want to make sure again we're planning right. So obviously this is typically in our later stages of retirement, but to kind of kind of hammer on this uh, point tonight, I have Florence here. Uh, she qualifies for long term care benefits. She receives in home care of uh, sixty thousand dollars per year. Uh, she has twenty thousand dollars a year in Social Security, and she has about four hundred thousand dollars in her IRA. So she has a life insurance policy with a long term care rider. And if any of you are not familiar with that, um, nowadays in the last you know, 10 to 15, I would say in the last five to 15 years or so, uh, these life insurance policies with long-term care riders have become a little bit more popular. Um, you know, just a life insurance policy, right? You know, it, it covers, you know, any expenses and things that, you know, you might want to send to your heirs tax-free, but sometimes the cash value is not significant enough to obviously help with a long-term care event. On the flip side, just a long-term care policy is what we typically call lose, use it or lose it, right? Meaning that if you don't have a long-term care event in your lifetime, but you've been paying all these premiums for the last 30, 40 years, when you pass away, the insurance company does not send a letter thanking your family for all the premiums you paid, right? Those premiums are gone, right? It just stays with the insurance company. So these hybrid policies are becoming a little bit more popular because in this case for Florence, she has a $500,000 death benefit that would go to her children. And for the sake of tonight, I'm going to give her two children, even though there's only uh, you know one person in the picture with her. Uh, so she has two children and then um, or a $10,000 per month long-term uh, care uh, rider on it. So that means that that, ride, that benefit would pay out $10,000 per month you know, for about uh, probably about two and a half, three years, depending on the policy. All right. So since Florence, and again, this might be a little unrealistic if most of us are in New York, but, uh, you know, because she pays little to no income tax. So she's going to, you know, for this example, it's going to be a little, um, you know, maybe not realistic, but her long-term care insurance pays the $300,000 for in-home care. So the $60,000 per year for the five years. So then her kids are going to inherit the rest of that life insurance money. So she started with 500 she used 300 of the policy through long-term care. So the kids are going to get $200,000 tax-free, so $100,000 each. And then the $400,000 taxable IRA is then going to get split up and then $200,000 to each child. All right, so not too bad. Each kid gets about, you know, um, you know $300,000, you know, uh, yeah, 300000 of the uh, of the money. Downside, rules have changed in the last few years where, Years ago, prior to about three or four years ago, if you passed on IRA assets to a non-spouse, they, the beneficiaries would be able to take that money over their life expectancy, meaning that they would only have to take out a little bit each and every year and mostly grow that money over the course of their time. So it was a nice inheritance. They could use it for, you know, uh, obviously to you know, pad their lifestyle and maybe even for their retirement. Unfortunately, the rules have changed where now the non-spouse beneficiary has 10 years from the date of passing to get every single dollar out of that account and make it zero. So if, you know, today's date, right, is uh, April 16th, uh, 2024, you have until April 16th, 2034 to get it completely out down to zero or your tax and penalties. So if we have, you know, millions of dollars inside of our IRA, and if you only have very few beneficiaries, they could be paying a lot of money in taxes that you didn't necessarily, you know, sign up for. So the other option here is that Florence could use the IRA money while she's alive. So she uses 300000 of the IRA to pay for the in-home care. Now her kids inherit the half a million dollar life insurance money all tax free, so 250 each, and then the $100,000 of the remaining taxable IRA. So they're each getting 50,000 of the IRA, which now they could just drop into their bank account at the end of the year that, you know, the IRS says, you know, you owe us 10, 15, 20, whatever, you know, it is that tax bracket they're in, in taxes. And then they could use that half a million dollar tax free death benefit to then pay the tax on that, you know, the money that they owe. So that is something that we talk about where 
the lineage of you know what makes the most sense for you, right? Does it make sense to draw down more of your taxable money uh, to pay for that care, or really anything in retirement, right? Of uh, you know using that taxable money, or do we use tax-free money and then potentially pass that taxable money on to the heirs or the spouse, or, you know, whoever it might be? And again, with our retirement income tool, advanced time segmentation, I'm going to get into that a little bit. We can run both of those scenarios for you, right? Kind of show you, hey, this is what your taxes are today with the current tax, you know, brackets. This is, you know, if they stay the same, obviously we don't know what the future holds, but, you know, uh, holding bar that, you know, everything stays at least somewhat in the ballpark tax wise. This is what you know, your your kids, grandkids, you know, any other heirs that you may have that you know, would, would receive. So you can take a look at the benefits to you today, the benefits to your money down the road. And the last part of the taxes is, you know, we are looking at this at four different stages, right? Is pre-retirement kind of gearing up for retirement, seeing, you know, where we might fall. Does it make sense to start funding some of those Roths? Does Roth conversions make sense? Um, you know, again, right, if you are cutting back and working part time, does it make sense to just live off that money of your you know, taxable money to you know give the lifestyle that you want and maybe delay Social Security? Does it make sense to just, you know, again, um, you know, fill the bracket with the Roth conversions to get as much into that as possible. Then once we get into early retirement, right, we want to understand our provisional income. We want to understand how all of our tax, you know, our retirement income is going to be taxed and you know, again now and in the future. And then we start getting to middle retirement, we start talking about those dreaded required minimum distributions. Uh, so I, for some of you on, uh, on, uh, for tonight, it might be 72, 73, um, others, it might be 75, right? If you were born after 1960, it's 75 now. Good news is it's 75, right? They delayed it five years, you know, four and a half years from the original 70 and a half that it was a few years ago. Bad news is they delayed it four and a half years, you know, 75, right? So that gives us four and a half more years of deferment that if we're not touching it, it's going to grow. And because you are now four and a half years older, the factor is going to be much higher because your life expectancy is shorter. So you're going to be taking out a lot more money than you did uh, compared to if you took it at 70 and a half, right? Uh, we usually say, you know, um, if the politicians in Washington all agreed on something to, you know, uh, to go through, it usually means we're paying more taxes in the long run. And unfortunately, this is one of the things, right? Everybody kind of thought, oh, it's great. We, we get the delay of when we take our required minimums. Yeah, no, they did it for a reason. They're going to get more money out of you if, you if you just delay. So having a strategy with those required minimum distributions can be very pivotal to maybe avoiding some of those IRMAs and things that you know, we went through earlier tonight because of the fact that we are now looking at, you know, not only just, you know, your retirement income, but are we giving it all back to the IRS? And then lastly, for re, uh, late retirement is making sure that the assets are organized and uh, all the intentions are there, meaning that, you know, if we go through a retirement income plan, we take care of your standard of living, make sure that we get through retirement with inflation adjusted income, and we're doing all the things that we want to do in retirement and enjoying that stage of our life. But then we also want to make sure that all those assets, whether it's real estate investments, you know, the 401s, houses, whatever it is that you have, we want to make sure it then goes to whoever your heirs are in the most tax efficient plan possible. So this is where we would re you know, uh, require some help from estate attorneys. We don't you know, draw up you know, wills or trust in that nature, but we are able to manage all the things inside of those things. But I'm pretty sure everybody tonight do, does not or did not wake up every single day and bust your butt to go to work and pour money into investments and do whatever it did you had to do to get to this stage in your life just for your money to go to the IRS, right? That's not why we did this. So as part of that retirement income plan is to make sure that you, not only do you get to live the lifestyle that you want and do all the things on that bucket list, but also, when the time comes that both if you are you know, a, a married couple, or whether it's you or married couple, you're no longer around, all those assets are going to the people or organizations that you want, not just going to the IRS. And that's how and how do you know, Dominic, Jeremy and myself do this? It is with advanced time segmentation. We match your assets to your income needs. So for some of our clients on here tonight, um, 
you know, you may have this. If not, you know, we we could further that conversation. For those of you who are not clients, this is a tool that is. There's many different types of distribution strategies out there. This is one that we use time to make sure that we are not taking unnecessary risk uh, with our investments and making sure that we have the income that we want when we need it. We adjust for inflation and we also are growing the assets over the long term. So those are the three time segments, income now or you know, whenever you decide to retire, future income. So we're going to give you that inflation adjusted income over your retirement and then long term growth. And then specifically within these three time segments. We then have five different categories of money to make sure things are doing different jobs, right? If we have just one pot of money, it is very hard to grow your money, take income, because there are very few tools that do all the thing in one, right? You don't want, you know, someone coming to your house that says, I'm a plumber and I'm also a master mechanic and I'm also your accountant, right? No, we have specialists for a reason. It's the same thing with your tools inside of your retirement income plan. So if we're looking for income generation, we want tools that are specifically for income generation, right? If we are looking for long-term growth, we want things that are very good at long-term growth. And then if we have something that might be in a little holding pattern that we might be using over the next couple of years, no, I don't want that in the S&P 500 where we could you know, potentially lose 40% in a year, right? We want it nice and safe and it's accountable. So when we do need it in three to five years, it's in a nice safe place getting some type of you know uh, interest on our money. So we would definitely go through all this in a you know a, a much more uh, expansive conversation when we uh, you know, either sit down or talk um, you know in more detail of how all these categories come together to give you a successful retirement income plan. Um, and it is something that we monitor all the time to make sure, like I mentioned a couple of times, that you're getting the money that you you want, the money you need. And then also when it does come time to pass that on to the next generation, we are making sure that it is tax efficient. So this is how we are able to Track your provisional income when it comes to Social Security. If we could avoid the IRMA as much as possible, if we could avoid getting actually hammered, you know, at our, our required minimum distribution ages, this tool allows us to, you know, plan that down the road and be able to pivot and do all the things that we need to, so you are able to not have to worry about it and just, you know, concentrate on taking care of yourself and planning those trips and doing everything that you want to do in retirement. Um, so I'm going to uh, you know, stop here. Uh, I appreciate you spending the time with us tonight um, and uh, look forward to speaking to you again in the future. All right. Thanks, Augie. Um, so there is a couple questions. Uh, most of them are on the more uh, personal side. So what I would highly recommend is that if you did ask a question, reach out to your advisor, whether it's me, Augie, or Jeremy, and we can make sure we get you that either with the Social Security analysis, whether it's an income plan. Um, again, I put our website in the chat. So if you have any specific questions on anything that we talked about tonight, go to our website, call us directly. You can text us, call us, email us on the website, whatever is easier for you guys. But uh, thank everybody very much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Augie, for the presentation. And we will see you all soon. Have a great night.